Especially in times like these when we're separated from the rest of the world, quarantined in our house, we really realize how good God is. He's good in the highs and the lows. He's good in the best times and in the quiet times. God is just so good. And times like this really make us appreciate fellowship, hugs, hanging out with a friend. So I want to sing about God's goodness because he's just, he's just so good. God, we love you. You are just so good. You are faithful. You are present in every single situation. Yeah. 
Some of you have lost hope. You don't want to praise at midnight. You feel like midnight's been your whole life. You've been praising, you've been praising. Nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. But God's trying to fix your heart posture. It's not a transaction. It's not an equation. You don't praise to get the healing. You praise because he's God. And because he's God, he will heal you. He's fixing your heart posture. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. moving right now. He's calling some of you to the altar. He's calling some of you to repentance. He's calling some of you to repentance, whether it's at your seat, whether it's at the altar. If you need prayer, please come. Please come. Please come. The Lord will heal your situation. The Lord's got you covered. Oh, he's reaching for you in the midnight hour. Just receive his help. Receive his hand. Oh, Jesus. He is moving in this place. He is moving in this place. He is moving in this place. God, we surrender all to you. All our sin, all our addiction, all our shame, and all our guilt, and all our shame, and all our guilt, and all our shame, and all our guilt. In all our troubles, we lay it at the altar. We lay it at the altar. We lay it at the altar. Yes. Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. Let your fire fall. Let your fire fall. Burn out all flesh. 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 He is burning off the flesh. He is burning off the flesh right now. He is burning off the flesh right now. Oh yes. Out of the shadows. Out of the shadows. And out of the shadows.
into tomorrow. You don't wait for sunrise. You will move at midnight. And out of my worry, nothing but worship. I will wait for sunrise. I will, I will praise at midnight. And you will walk me past my valley. your hands up. Whatever you need, it's in the presence of the Lord even right now. It's in the presence of the Lord even right now. If I can get you, just lift your hands and just close your eyes. And they receive from the Lord. Just begin to receive from your Father. He is here to meet your need. He is here. I'm not trying to bring you a prophetic word, but I sense there's a river river in this place today, a river of blessings, a river flowing, a river of healing, a river of healing, a river of deliverance, a river of breakthrough. And this is a new day. This is the dawn of a new day. This is a river. We're in the river. Step into the river. Step into the river. I believe that this is a time for us to step out of the boat. 
we are stepping into the supernatural. You go on a break, you're on supernatural. Somebody just lift your hands. Just worship. Just worship. I will praise at midnight. I believe Paul and Silas praise at midnight. And there was a breaking in the spirit. There was a jail break in the spirit. I believe somebody can praise and then breaking the spirit. I believe if somebody can praise, there will be a breaking in the spirit. I believe if somebody can just shout out to the Lord, wherever you are right now, if you're watching online, I want you to shout, there is a river, there is a river, there is a flow, there is a river, there is a river. upon the Lord that's when our healing comes as we focus upon the Lord it's when our breakthrough comes our deliverance come our healing come when we are focused when we gaze upon him somebody just lift your hand just for a few moments and just gaze upon the Lord gaze upon his goodness gaze upon his mercy in Luke 18, there was a blind man, and he kind of found out what is this commotion going on. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. He could not see. He could not see. He wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see what was going on. And I believe that those of you that can see in the physical, God is going to give you spiritual sight that you can see your healing, that you can see your breakthrough, that you can see your deliverance, you can see your family blessed, you can see promotion on your job, you can see breakthrough everywhere, blessings, favor, and increase in every area of your life. Hallelujah. Somebody shout. altar call. I believe that was a moment for us to surrender. Maybe you surrender your seat. You're watching online and you said, I need to surrender and give my entire life to the Lord. This is the opportunity to surrender unto Him because He wants to give us new life. Somebody shout new life. Somebody shout new life. And I believe that this is a season for new life. This is a season for outbreak. We've been in our homes for a whole month, almost two months. And I believe there's a people of God that is desperate for God, that is eager to get into the house of God. I say, God, despite all I've been through, I still have my praise. I still have my worship. Hallelujah! You know what I want us to do right now? I want us in this, in this atmosphere... I want us to give. I want us to tithe, give an offering, and I want us to sow in this atmosphere as we worship. There's something about sowing into an atmosphere of glory. When you sow into glory, you receive abundance. When you sow into the kingdom, you receive abundance. And I believe this is, this is, this is conducive for giving and for sowing. The atmosphere is conducive for the glory of God. And so those of you get your tithe in your hand and your offering. And I want you to come and give God your seed a sacrifice. A sacrifice. A sacrifice seed. Today is your day of breakthrough. Today is your day of healing. Today is your day of deliverance. So as we come, this is given to the Lord. Let us, those of you online, you can give, you can text to give, you can text to give. I'm going to online, the, the website, you can give. But I want to give sacrificially unto the Lord today. Sacrificially unto the Lord today. And I'm, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sow to what I saw. I saw an angel stand beside as we beat the drum as I was... He was worshiping. I saw an angel and I was like, what is this angel? And the angel was said, presence, angel of presence, angel of presence, angel of presence. Listen to me. I believe that even now in the next 120 days that God is about to do something in Destiny Church that you have never seen it before. 
and I say, oh God, I say, God, I want to be a part of this move. I want to be a part of it. So right now, I'm not showing out or anything. And I, I, I'm going to sow $120 today because I want to be a part of the rhythm. I want to be a part of the move of God. For when God is about to outbreak in this place, there's about to be a move of God in your family, in your home, in Ocala, Florida. You're watching right now. There's about to be a move of God in your home. Lord, there's more than gifts. I want to give unto the Lord. I want to give into what God is about to do in our midst, in our ministry, in our family, in our community. I want to give into souls. I want to sow into souls. God doesn't need our money, but He needs the act of obedience. Our obedience is better than the sacrifice. And when we walk in that obedience, God will abundantly bless us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more time, give God the loudest shout of praise that you can give Him. Destiny Church, God bless you. Our pastors are in the house. Come on. Give it up for them. You may be seeing the presence of the Lord. We're happy to look at you and say, neighbor, I'm happy to see you. Come on, tell them, talk to them, neighbor. I'm happy to see you. Being on a long vacation. <laughs> but I'm happy to see you. Hallelujah. We are in our father's house. And like I said, our doctors, our pastors are in the house today. And God bless all of you. Um, uh, thank God for you. I know this Wednesday we'll still be live again on Facebook. Yes. Facebook live on Wednesday and Ruko. So go to your Facebook live at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Um, at 7 p.m. So we won't be here at the, at the sanctuary. We'll be in our homes watching um, the Facebook Live. Also on Friday nights at 7 p.m. is our youth. And let me see all the first-time guests, visitors here. All the first-time visitors, lift your hand if you're first-time visitors. Come on, let's give God a destiny. <laughs> Shout a phrase. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for having you. Hope that you have a great time and enjoy the service today. And so, yes, Friday night will be our youth. And also... Um, Next week, next week, Sunday is Mother's Day. So bring your mom with you. Our pastors will be praying for them and believing God for them and they need healing. So bring your mom next Sunday. I believe that God is going to do some amazing and marvelous things. Amen? Hallelujah. God bless all of you. And, and those of you that are listening, there we have connect cards and information you need to fill out. We have information for you and we're here to serve you. God bless you, everybody. Praise God. Thanks, Kareem. Praise God. Hallelujah. I don't even have to ask. How many is excited to be here today? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. He is so good. Join me, Pastor Jay. We're going to pray over this offering. If you have brought an offering in a form of a credit card or a debit card or something, you need to use the kiosk. It's in the back here. You're welcome to go back there. <coughs> Excuse me. Angela will help you through that if they have a little problem getting, getting it going. But... Um, thank you, Kareem, and thank you for the worship team, Angela, for what y'all did. Appreciate that art. You guys, thank God for you. We appreciate it. Thank you, Destiny Church, for being here today. Amen. Isn't this something? We're back. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going we're gonna to storm the gates of hell. Amen. We're just going to do the things we need to do. How many of you missed being a part of church? Yeah. Yep. Actually, I have to admit, it was kind of cool at first, but uh, after a while, I just missed everybody. <laughs> you know, TV part of it's kind of cool, but um, when it comes right down to it, we need iron to sharpen iron. We need corporate mantles. We need people to come together. That's why he says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some. Even in that day, there was a slow fade already happening, but he said, no, 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 don't do that. Stay together because there's more to it than number. It's not about how many people they could pack into their house. It was about the corporate mantle and what was taking place whenever we came together. Amen. Because I tell you what, the demons don't want to separate either. They will, they will congregate over your house. They will come together, virus or not, and they will try to take you out. So we've got to be more warfare-minded and understand that we've got to be together. Amen. And two of us is smarter than one of us, and three of us is stronger than one of us. And as a three-fold cord is not easily broken, so the body of Christ, when we come together, amen, is not going to be easily torn apart. If you would, stretch your hands this way. We're going to pray over this offering, and we're going to believe God with you for a blessing back upon your life, which is biblical, and we're going to call it out right now. And Father, we thank you.
Thank you, first of all, for this gift, for the offering, for those who gave today. Thank you, Lord, and we return it to you. Ask that you would receive this back into your kingdom, God, in a natural thing into a spiritual thing. And God, let your anointing be upon it to accomplish everything that needs to be done. That we trust that you've spoken to people who can hear and obey the word of God and the voice of God and that all needs will be met according to your will. And God, we thank you for that. And I know that you have sheep that we don't even know about and you have funds that we can't even know about, oh God. And you are given from the north, south, east, and west. And I thank you for it. But God, today I, I come to you, Lord Jesus, asking that you would look upon every giver. God, look upon everyone who released seed into their future, oh God. It's not going to leave their life. It's going to go somewhere in their future and produce a harvest for them. And I pray, Lord, that you would be the Lord of the harvest and watch over this seed, that you would bless them in their going out and in their coming in, bless them in their baskets, their storehouses, bless them in their businesses, God, in everything they set their hands to do, in their jobs, give them favor, uncommon favor. And I thank you for it. I bless what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Whoo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is so good. Amen, amen. Why don't we stand up together just for a minute? Hallelujah. Let's just stand together. You're in a Pentecostal type church, so that's what you do. When the, if you was in a Catholic church, you'd be kneeling and standing back up. We, you know how we do. All right, hallelujah. You may be seated. I just want you to stand up for a second. Let, you know. Get your mind back together. Let's come back up here. I'm going to ask Pastor Jay to come right back up here with me because we're not done yet. There's a prophetic river that's flowing through this place. And there is a call for our hearts to turn to God. And sometimes churchiness does us more harm than good. We hear a word repent and we say, oh, that's for them. Because we have defined repent to mean I've done something wrong. And I need to fall on my knees in front of everybody and be shamed. But that's not what repent means. Repent just means to do an about face, to turn. And there's some things that are headed your way that God wants you to get out of the way of. Hallelujah. And that devil that's been chasing you, when you sidestep, that thing's going to hit him head on. Hallelujah. God just says repent. He says turn your heart, get your mind back into a place where we can be open to what God is going to tell us. Because if you truly believe the word of God is coming forth and there's something for you in it, you want your mind and your heart, your spirit to be open to what God is saying. Amen? Hallelujah. Do you have any takers in here today? Anybody who says, look, God, I just want to turn to you. I want to turn my attention, my focus, my family, my life, my finances, my everything. I want to turn it to you, God, because I know I'm living in a window of opportunity. I'm living in a moment of time. That window may be closer to being closed than we think it is. <laughs> but whatever that's happening, we need to know that while it's open, hallelujah, while we have this opportunity, we need to be sending up praises to the kingdom. We need to be taking authority. We need to be occupying until he comes. I know one translation is to do business till I come. Another translation is occupy. We need to occupy some schools. We need to occupy some city councils. We need to occupy some, some town governments. We need to occupy our space and be dominant in our space. When we walk in, the enemy needs to walk out. Hallelujah. There's not even a challenge because the authority is upon us. It precedes us like a fire that goes before us. It consumes the enemy. So we should not walk in timid and broken and, and all excuse making for, for what we haven't lived up to. We need to walk in authority and fire and power in the anointing of God. And I'm here to tell you, today is a special day for you. Hallelujah. And so I'm going to ask Pastor Jacinta just to pray again over us and just to release whatever God's doing in her heart right now. And I may have just put her right up on the spot. She hates that, but she is anointed. And I know some things she was saying to me as we were getting ready this morning. And, she, and I know God has been speaking to her spirit. And then no, none of us knew what Angela was going to do. We never know what Angela's going to do because I don't give her a list to come up here and do. I tell Angela, your assignment is not to hand me a cold pulpit. That's your assignment. I don't care if it's short, if it's long, if it's loud, if it's soft, if it's fast, if it's slow. Don't hand me an ice cold pulpit. When I step up, I want to step into the anointing of God because somebody is hanging between heaven and hell. And it's my job to release them a word that they can grab a hold to like a rope and make a choice of which eternity they want to spend. 
And so with that said, I want you just to do whatever the Lord has laid upon your heart to do it. Well, I do want to share a couple of things with you. And I feel like the Lord was speaking to me all this week about dry places. And uh, many of you are watching by way of web. I know it's no one in here. But, um, right? Come on, somebody. Okay. So, oh, of course not. But um, you've been in a dry place. And in this dry place, you feel like you've lost your way somehow. And, and some of you may have been dabbling in this and dabbling in that, and you know better. And when you know better, you what? You do better, right? Right? So the Lord wants you to drink up. He wants a good belly gu guzzling. You know, you know the days when you were out in the bars. Come on, somebody. You know some of y'all have been out in the bars, okay? And um, no, I have it. Right? Some of y'all know my testimony, but I have it. But that doesn't mean that I, haven't had a, I don't have a testimony either, right? But God wants you to take a big, a big old, come on, everybody hold your hand up. Come on, you got a cup? And then take a big old drink. The Lord wants to give you a big old drink of fresh Holy Ghost and fire in your life. Yes. He wants to give you a fresh touch from heaven is what he wants to do. And you know, yeah, and you know, the, the word says... You enter his gates with praise and thanksgiving. Okay? What if you don't? What if you don't give him praise? Do you enter in? Okay. Okay. See, anybody can praise him. Anybody can praise him. People in the street can praise him. Hallelujah. But he wants your worship. He wants your authentic worship. He says you enter the gate with praise and thanksgiving. And some of you feel like you don't even have anything to thank God for. You do. You're like, Lord, you know what? This person over here blessed and this person over here blessed. Lord, what about you? forgot about me. The Lord says you shall enter the gates with praise and thanksgiving. That means don't even step on my property if you're not going to praise and thank me. <laughs> and some of y'all worried about what you don't have. And about what other people may have? Where's your praise? Where's your thanksgiving? He wants your authentic, pure worship this morning. You must worship him in spirit and truth. And, and you know what? Because God, is, we're spirit, soul, and body. He doesn't want you to have this lip service, Lord, I worship you, I worship you. No. He wants a true, pure, authentic worship. When it comes from deep within. You know when you're crying out to God and you need a miracle, he wants that kind of worship. And it's a lifestyle. It's not just to come up in a service and say, okay, I did my duty for the week. That's not what it's about. It's about an authentic worship, a pure and a holy reverence for the things of God. It's about getting at his feet. It's about surrendering. It's about laying things down at his feet. Our attitudes, it needs a check out. Some of you need to serve a eviction notice on the devil. You need to. Because you've been taking camp. You've been going out camping with the enemy. And some of you, it's in your house. But you need to serve a eviction notice on the enemy today. The Lord wants you to evict him. And he says he's giving you all authority. So would you not receive today? Receive today the word that's coming. And do an inventory of your heart and where you're at and in your walk. And even if that means you've got to get up out of here today, go outside, shake it off, and walk back in. Even if it means you come up to the altar and you lay things down. It has to be a sacrifice of worship. In spirit, soul, and body. An authentic worship before the Lord. And how do we worship? It's not just with our giving. It's not with, with just our lip service. We worship God for who he is. It's because of who he is. Not because of the things he's done. It's because of who he is. Hallelujah. If he never healed me again, Come on. he's still my healer. Yes. If he never provided for me again, he's still my provider. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Mother Emma, I feel like the Lord is saying today that he's seen your faithfulness. He's watched you in the times when you could be among his people, and he's watched you when you've had to be isolated alone, not for a virus, but just from health or issues or finances or transportation. 
And God said he has watched you and he has watched over you, but he is raising you to another level in Zion. God said there's going to be a prophetic edge that you're going to develop in his kingdom where you're going to be able not just to see things, but you're going to be able to articulate things and not just have dreams, but interpret dreams. And God said, I'm going to raise you up as a voice in this final hour, a voice to the generation that follows a teacher in his word. I thank God for that. Hallelujah. Somebody rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. Listen, God is, he's, God is still on the throne. And that was never in question. Hallelujah. Whew. How many of you know that God is a healer? Believe that? You believe he's a healer? Hallelujah. I'm talking about whenever the doctor says it cannot happen, faith says, yes, it can. When the lawyer says, I can't help you, faith says, I can help you. Hallelujah. When there's no answer any other way, God shows up and takes care of business. Hallelujah. Sitting in our room with us today, we have a living, walking, breathing miracle. And Brother Everett Charles. And I want to ask him if he would to just give his testimony today. And share with us what God has done in his life and in his body. Amen. Yeah, if you'll take him a microphone back there. And if somebody will get the other lights for us. I have to shout this. <laughs> As you all know, I had heart trouble. I was in stage four of congestive heart failure. And I even met with the pastor one day and said, Lord, I, or pastor, I think I'm going to die. <laughs> but Easter Sunday morning at 5.30, I felt to call the pastor. <laughs> and he answered. <laughs> Because I felt the Holy Ghost in such a way that I have never, never felt it before. I think I felt just like Samson. I believe I could have bent nails. <laughs> and I was healed. Amen. Be before that, before that, I could not even brush my teeth without being wore out. If I walked a hundred feet, I'd have to stop three or four times. Now, I mowed my yard, <laughs> cleaned my driveway, Come on. and I helped put in a dishwasher. <laughs> so, I'm healed. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We called Brother Everett our four-minute Lazarus because when he went to the hospital once and he, he actually died on the, on the operating table. He died there on the, in the hospital for four minutes and then they brought him back. So we called him our four-minute Lazarus. <laughs> Lazarus is dead four days, but God's just showing you he's still in the healing business, the resurrection and the life. Hallelujah. There's so many things that God has done, many testimonies and because we've been away from our gathering here, um, sometimes we lose, we lose touch with people and what's going on in terms of, of being able to physically see and speak. But we, we try to stay in touch socially with social media. But, you know, social media is probably the most antisocial thing we've ever created. <clears throat> if you don't believe it, just pick five random Facebook friends that you don't know other than Facebook and go to their house. I'm your Facebook friend. They will call the police on you. <laughs> You're a stalker. <laughs> Some, you a creep. What are you doing at my house? But now they just cut up with you all on social media because it's, it's fake. Like most everything else the devil throws at us. Mm, come on with it. Oh, go ahead, sister. She's, gonna, she's going to put a mic up because we're recording. And the folks on TV can't hear what we're saying if we're not in a mic. Give me it's confirmation. Whew. He's been whispering those words in my spirit. Wow. For some time. So I know it's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> He's on the throne. Amen. Thank you, Hallelujah. Amen, amen. 
Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank God for confirmations. Amen of his word. Today I want to be um, brief, but I always want to be brief, and I'm not. But <laughs> today I want to be brief. But I, I want to bring a quick word to us. We've got, we're preparing food out there. I don't know if you saw the grills are cranked up, and there's chicken on the grill, and he's barbecuing chicken. He's got hot dogs. You know, chicken is a Pentecostal thing. He died that we might live. You know what I'm saying? So... <laughs> He's got, we got chicken on the grill. We got stuff going on. If you want to be a part of that, I won't be long. We'll be able to fellowship together. Um, those of you that are still somewhat concerned about what's happening and you feel like you need to distance, if you don't want to be a part of that, I understand that. Or if you grab your chicken and run, we get it. It's okay. But um, I just believe that I wanted our fellowship to be here too. Not just, not just singing and dancing and hearing a word, but also just being able to talk to one another again and interact a little bit for a moment. And so we're going to share a meal out here today. It's, uh, the church took care of this. A couple of people, we didn't have a potluck. We didn't ask people to bring things. Just took care of it so that we could come together and, and do this. And so we, we give God praise for that. And uh, thank you for those who helped us with the food distribution too the other day. A lot of people came up and was, were helping us get rid of some of that. We were able to, we were able to distribute over two pallets of food um, from eggs to to uh, mashed potatoes and garlic mashed potatoes and boxes of heavenly delight. <laughs> you know I'm talking about Brother Gordon, those little boxes. <laughs> we, they, they belong for the homeless. I had to repent because I took one of them, man. I opened that thing up. I said, Lord, I ain't homeless, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break into this. You know, you don't put one of those in front of a fat man. <laughs> He's going to have to have some of that. But um, anyways, if you have your Bibles and would like to turn with me, either turn your Bible on or click to it or open it up. Um, we're going to be in the book of John chapter 4. It's going to be a familiar passage. Um, we are also broadcasting on television, and that's why you, you'll see the screen change some back and forth. And sometimes when you broadcast on TV, you have a lot more critics. So I'll bring my Bible up here for the religious people who says he preaches without a Bible. <laughs> they don't realize I have a tablet right here. I'm, I do have the Bible, but it's just on um, a tablet. So I have it now. Everybody, we're on the same page. It's all good. So you stay with me here. John 4 is a, is a story, and I'm going to just read through it so we'll get the gist of everything, and I'll, I will extract from it what I feel like God is saying to us today. And it's something I, I didn't know Pastor Jacinta was going to mention what she said because when we were talking earlier, it was along a, along a little bit different line. But when she talked about taking a huge drink, um, what I want to talk about today is spiritual dehydration. Spiritual dehydration. And stay with me as we do this. And I don't want to lose you in the weeds of what I'm going to talk about. And it may not be hooping and hollering, but I want you to get the gist of what he's saying today because there is a danger of us becoming dehydrated in the spirit. There's a danger of us not drinking from the well. And we, we find other things to drink, other things to satisfy our thirst. And we find ourselves away from the call and destiny that God has placed in our life. And so I'm here today to just just to give us a little bit of a maybe a course correction if you need it and or just an encouragement if this is what it is to you. But in John 4 it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, verse 2 clarifies parenthetically, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, then he left, he says, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. He must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, he sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith to her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away to the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, asketh me of drink, or ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Mm -hmm. Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said unto him, Sir, you don't even have anything to draw with, and the well is deep. 
from whence then hast thou living water? <clears throat> Are thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus answered and said unto her, You have said well, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not even thy husband. I added even. And in that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Whew. Father, I ask you today to just flood this place. Let your anointing just fill this room. And even in this oration, in this speaking, God, may while the word is being spoken, may healings take place. May life for people change. May their faith arise. Or may we see a place where we need to make correction and may we find it in you. And may we not confuse conviction with condemnation. May we not call conviction condemnation, but may we see conviction as a call from you to be doing the right thing at the right time for the right purpose. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Today I want to talk to you about spiritual dehydration. Think of what you need today to survive in this life. <clears throat> Food, water, air, Facebook, Twitter, <laughs> and YouTube. <laughs> Naturally, today I'm going to speak about water. <laughs> water is of the most important to all living things, and some organisms up to 90% of their body weight comes from water. Up to 60% of the human body is water. According to H.H. H. Mitchell, and I'm going to give you some facts, but I'm, don't let me lose you. Stay with me because I want to get to the end of this. According to H.H. H. Mitch, Mitchell, Journal of Biological Chemistry, the brain and heart are composed of 73% water. The lungs are about 83% water. The skin contains 64% water. The muscles and kidneys are 79%. Even the bones are watery at 31%. Each day, humans must consume a certain amount of water to survive. Of course, this varies according to age and gender, also by where someone lives. Generally, an adult male needs about three liters of water a day, while an adult female needs about two liters of water a day. Don't let the scientists know that they left out the transgender, because they will really come to their rescue at this point. All of the water a person needs does not have to come from drinking liquids as some of this water is contained in the food we eat. Water serves a number of essential functions to keep us all going. A vital nutrient to the life of every cell in your body. It acts first as a building material to help your cells be able to build up antibodies, all the things that has to happen in your body. It regulates our internal body temperature by sweating and respiration. Breathing in, breathing out. Some 12%, you lose 12% of the water in your body in one night's sleep. Exhaling, breathing out. The carbohydrates and proteins that our bodies use as food are metabolized and transported by water in the bloodstream. Oftentimes, people confuse high blood pressure with other issues when 99% of the time, high blood pressure is dehydration at a cellular level. Your brain, which is made up of water and needs water to survive, has to have water. It gets its water from the blood flow. 
As the blood passes through the brain, it extracts moisture from the blood cells. When this happens, <clears throat> the brain can then function and be clear. When there's not enough moisture in your blood cells because it's thick with all sorts of other things that we've put in to replace the water, the brain cannot get enough out of the normal amount of blood that would flow through. So the brain tells the body, the arteries, to tighten up. And when it tightens up, it squeezes more pressure on the blood system. It goes up to get more blood in the brain than would normally be there so that it can get the amount of water that it needs. The brain is literally thirsting to death. And so your body is trying to help you survive by raising your blood pressure. And what happens, you go to the doctor and he gives you pills to knock the water off of you to drop your blood pressure, and your brain is now really thirsting to death. And that's why you end up with most of the time with side effects and things that happen to you because truthfully you could have fixed a lot of it by hydrating at a cellular level, which is not just water. It's electrolytes and other things that you need to take in. And you hydrate at a cellular level and stay hydrated and your blood pressure will level out most of the time. There are other extenuating circumstances, but I'm just saying a lot of the time that things that you're going through, you don't even realize it. And it's not always in the New England Journal of Medicine and it's not always something that your doctor may know. He may be looking at family history of blood pressure and he may be looking at all of these things and overlook the fact that you are dehydrated at a cellular level. Water and, and, and hydration assists in flushing waste out of your body. It acts as a shock absorber for the brain, the spinal cord, and even a fetus. You ever heard, heard of the mama's water breaking? It forms saliva, it lubricates joints, and time today constrains me to tell you all the necessities of water in our body. You must regularly at different intervals take in a certain amount of water to remain healthy and to function your best. But more dangerous than that, your body requires a minimum of water just to stay alive. The stages between optimal and death is where I'm going to be today as I'm talking about your spiritual man. How many of you know your spirit, soul, and body? We're all three. And today I want to take some of the facts from our natural body and apply it to our spirit for just a moment. Isaiah 12 and 3 says, Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Once again, salvation is tied to water. And we know that the Spirit of God is often referred to as water. It's the water of His Word, the water of His Spirit, and it's that well of living water that lives on the inside of us. The Spirit of God or the Holy Ghost of God is referred to as a well of springing water even in our text today. Water that if consumed, there will be no need to find other sources or substitute liquids to take our, uh, to satisfy our craving of thirst. You won't have to look for some other way to do it. When we look into the story that I read you a few moments ago, we find Jesus asking for water. Prophetically, we find a well sitting on a well. <laughs> yeah. Prophetically, we find the well of living water sitting on a well of natural water. And this well was asking for a drink of the natural water so that he could do just what I'm going to do today and apply it to the spiritual side of things in hopes that your life will change into another dimension when you realize how much power is in the water of God's Spirit and how much you really need to receive the power of the Holy Spirit of God to live on the inside of you. Huh. Jesus is asking for water and he uses that opportunity to explain spiritual water. Our story finds Jesus must needs go through Samaria. And those of you that understand the Bible, been a part of church any length of time, you know the stories of how the Jewish people did not associate with the Samaritan people. And in those days, it was customary to go a day's journey out of the way just to keep from encountering a Samaritan. That's why the story was so powerful when Jesus told of the good Samaritan who found the man in the ditch and did not question his ethnicity. He just helped him out of the ditch. Come on, somebody. And so the good Samaritan was a type and shadow of what we need to be as Christians in the world today. When we look into the ditch, we don't look at the identity of a person or the ethnicity of a person to decide if we're going to help them or not. 
When we look at the ditch, we must understand, but for the grace of God, there go I. And we want to reach and try to pull somebody up out of their condition. Hallelujah. Most understand the dichotomy of a Jewish person interacting with a Samaritan. Many times they would have to go through unclean rituals if they came into the presence of Samaritans. Several exchanges took place with Jesus and this person in Samaria. But he did not come to embarrass this woman. He came to save her. I've heard many preachers take this passage and preach on divorce. This passage wasn't about divorce. I've heard them take this passage and preach on women living lifestyles of, you know, that, that's lascivious. That's not what this passage was about. For every woman that's lascivious with a man, there has to be a lascivious man. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Everybody want to stone the woman, but who was she with? Come on, where's he at? So don't get me there. That's not what this message was about today. You see, the point that I want to make to you is that Jesus must needs go through Samaria. He knew there was some con uh, there was going to be a conversation that needed to take place with this woman. He knew she would be coming around the sixth hour of the day, which was not common because most of the women went early in the morning, and she went alone because her reputation was one of those reputations that she didn't want to be around anyone, and they all talked about her because of her lifestyle. And so she would go it alone. If he knew she was coming, then he knew who she was. And if he knew who she was, he knew who she wasn't. And if he knew who she wasn't, he knew things she had done in her life. But Jesus came to the well anyway. If this was about a woman who had been married many times, Jesus would not have even come to the well. But he knew her, yet he loved her. Hallelujah. He knew me, yet he loved me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Whew. Jesus came to the well anyway. He sat down already knowing who he was talking to. Your sin did not catch God off guard. Your, your failure did not catch God off guard. Your mistakes, the things you've gone through, the things that have stigmatized you, did not catch him off guard. He purposely went to your well knowing that about you because he wants to come and set you free from those things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This woman had made choices and decisions that took her away from a normal life and set her on a road to loneliness, bad reputation, settling for less than what God had designed for her life. Her decisions in the natural have affected her spiritual condition. you got to hear that sentence. Her decisions in the natural affected her spiritual condition. You can do things in your body that will inhibit things in your spirit. You can do things in your body that will cause the Holy Spirit to draw back. I don't want to get into theologies today, but I promise you, you can put your hand to the plow and look back. Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. I know there are doctrines that say once you're saved, you're always saved. And any sin that you commit after that was already paid for, and it was but it's not repudiated in terms of redemption unless you repent of it. Repent is the first word of the gospel. Unless we repent. Jesus, he died for the sins I had not yet committed. But if I had not repented in my life at some point, I would have fallen into a devil's hell at the end of my journey. Because there, we're eternal beings when God touches our life. When heaven touches earth, we're eternal. The spirit in you will return to God from whence it came. The flesh on you will return to the dust from whence it came. But the soul of man shall never die. The soul of man will either live eternally in heaven or die eternally in hell. It's eternal one way or the other. You're either going to have eternal life or eternal death. The choice belongs to you and it's not about what church you attend. It's about the relationship you have with the creator of life itself. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter how many husbands you've had or how many times you've gone to the well in the middle of the day. It doesn't matter that the man you're living with is not your husband. Jesus still died for you. Hallelujah. He's still reaching for you. Hallelujah. If you're connecting with us by way of television today, I want you to know that God transcends time and distance and He speaks right to you today in this message. I want you to hear me when I tell you 
that no matter where you've been, no matter how long you've been drunk, Jesus loves you and he's got a plan for your life. And if you will just come home to him today, he will make things right in your world. Hallelujah. I want to speak to your spiritual being for just a minute as I get to this and wrap it up. Spirit, soul, and body, we focus on our bodies. We communicate with our bodies. We spend money on our bodies. We learn to live through our bodies. Our language comes through our body. Everything about us just about is with our body, but our emphasis should be equally upon our spirit, man. And when people get spiritual, people think they're spooky because they're spooky or they're crazy or something's wrong with them because they're abnormal whenever you just are walking along this carnal life. But when a person is walking and they're balanced in spirit, soul, and body, their soul is not vexed. They're not depressed. Things can happen in your body that affect your spirit. Things can happen in your spirit that affect your body. Doctors will even tell you that stress in your mind that you can't buy, sell, touch, feel, you can't do anything with it, it's in your mind, will cause a cancer to form in your body. Too much of this stress in your body, too much certain foods, too much of certain things will cause your body to react a different way. It can happen spiritually. You can have things happening in your body that will cause your spirit to become subdued. Prayer warriors and mighty men of God, healing evangelists have, have all of a sudden been, contract, been, been diagnosed with cancer. And suddenly their faith begins to fall. They can heal everybody else, physician, but heal yourself. And then the church, rather than rallying around to pick them up, they say, oh, they're false. They're not a God. And we become self-appointed flesh detectives. That's not a God. That's of the flesh. No, it's a test. It's a test for the man of God, and it's a test for the people of God. Hallelujah. You got to hear what I'm telling you today. And it affects spirit, soul, and body. But we're only comfortable in the body realm. When we start to move in the spirit realm, we see things that kind of freak us out sometimes. I remember in my ministry, over the course of the years of my ministry, I've, I've, I've ministered a lot in Tennessee and in Alabama and north of there and I've even in Kentucky and up in Connecticut and in some of these areas I've, I've encountered demonic encounters. I've had demons literally speak out of people. I've literally encountered um, people contorting and falling in the floor and slithering around just in the presence of the anointing. Nobody, nobody's up there trying to cast out devils and we're just talking. But the anointing is coming down in the floor and slithering around and slithering around. And, and, and I've, I've seen those kind of things happen. I, I had a man one time in a meeting, every time I would make a point, I would begin to look over here, I'd see something catch my eye. And so... I could, it kept distracting me, but I just kept preaching. And then finally, one of the times I pointed over this way, but I looked that way. And when I did, I saw his hand come up, and he's doing this, trying to throw some mojo on me or something. And out of my belly, not even me, not, I, I was just a young buck. I didn't have any, any sense. I still don't have a lot, but I, I had less then. And he says, out of, the, out of my innermost being, I said, I reversed the curse in the name of Jesus by the blood of the Lamb. And when I said that, he froze in that position. He was in that position until I dismissed the service. About an hour later. The woman beside him jumps up and screams as loud as she could, runs to the altar screaming, I need Jesus. Now, he was a pastor from another local church in the local area, I find out later. And the it was his wife that needed Jesus. I also found out later that you could go to him on Sunday and get prayer, but you could go on Saturday night and get a potion that will kill your ex. So they had all kind of demonic stuff going on. I've seen a lot of it. I'm telling you, I've seen so much. It will blow your mind. I don't want to distract from what I'm about to tell you. But when I got ready to come to Florida, I was moving back into Florida, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke so clearly to me. And He said, your ministry is going to shift because when you get to Florida, it's not going to be so much demons as it is flesh. And He said, take note of this. You can't cast out the flesh. I would rather 
go into a church with demonic presence and leave there victorious over death, hell, and the grave than come into a church full of flesh and have to explain my way out of the pulpit and tell them why I believe this and why I believe that. And everybody just got all their ideas. just flesh. And we make excuses. I'm not against, please don't think I'm being legalistic, but we take our clothes off and run to the beach and act like nothing's wrong with it. What are you saying, Pastor? Well, if you wore the same thing to a business meeting in New York, what would somebody think? How would you look? They would think you lost your mind. I'm not against bathing suits. I'm not against the beach. I love it. You know we love some beach. I told God when he said, come open a church in Ocala, I said, God, you say Daytona? He said, I said, Ocala. I said, I thought you said Daytona. <laughs> Destin? <laughs> Come on, God, don't be putting me right in the middle. <laughs> we got a beach. I love it. But we make excuses for doing things that we would never consider doing in another setting. You hear what I'm saying? How we reason with our flesh. And, and again, you've got to take what I just said and just apply it. Don't, I'm not trying to preach against anything. I'm simply saying flesh is so different than spirit. And flesh has ruled the church for so long that sometimes even well-meaning people literally are stumbling blocks for God's power and presence to move. One reason that, that areas and geographical locations go, long, go, go decades without a true move of God is because most of the time it's controlled by that good old boy mentality, even in the church. You can have a meeting at your church with somebody that the next state over would draw 5,000 people, but at your church, they're not even going to come. They will schedule something on the same day you schedule it just to keep from having to be here. That's flesh. That's the kind of thing. You can't cast that out. You cast the flesh out, they're dead. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm saying that to tell you that when I'm talking about spiritual dehydration, don't think in just terms of the flesh. But realize that your spirit man must, it must be able to drink from that river of living water. Hallelujah. Dehydration is a condition that can occur when the body loses fluids, mostly water, and exceeds the amount that's taken in. With dehydration, more water is moving out of an individual's cells than are moving in and the amount of water that's taken in through drinking or some other method, then you're, what you end up having is medically dehydration. And it usually means a person has lost enough fluid so the body begins to lose its ability to function normally, keep thinking spirit, and begins to produce symptoms related to fluid loss. When a person is spiritually dehydrated, they begin to produce symptoms of fluid loss. Fluid being Holy Ghost and fire. As we begin to pull further and further away from what God is doing, we tend, many people will tend to have some of the same symptoms. Some of these symptoms. The doctors will divide this thing into three categories. Dehydration is three stages. Mild, moderate, and severe. <laughs> Along with water, we lose salt. We lose electrolytes. I could preach an hour on salt. Our bodies are consistently re readjusting the balance between water or the salt and electrolytes losses with the fluid intake. When we lose too much water, our bodies may become out of balance. We begin to get dehydrated. When there's a mild case, and often even moderate dehydration can be reversed or put back into balance by oral intake of fluids. So... A mild or even sometimes moderate case, you can just drink something and, whew, oh, it feels good. You're getting electrolytes. That's a Gatorade, okay? Electrolytes. That's a, that's a, that's a Eddie James concert. <laughs> you're, getting some, you're getting some electrolytes in there, you know. And, and so I'm just saying it's, it's, it's a way that we can energize ourselves and be restored. But if it's unrecognized and untreated, in some instances of moderate and severe dehydration can lead to death. When you choose behaviors that are contrary to God's design for your life, you'll begin to starve your spirit of the nutrients that's needed to survive. Just as in the natural, there's many substitutes out there designed to quench your thirst, but nothing can substitute for the power of the Holy Ghost. 
We have soft drinks and coffee and fruit tasting drinks. I'm not preaching against this. I'm sorry. You have to say it. All I'm using is an example. We have these things and a plethora of great tasting liquids to entice us to make choices based on taste instead of nutrition. How many of us go to a church because we like it and not because we're assigned there? How many of us go to church because uh, Papa gave the pews and Mima gave the land? How many times do we just like what we see and so we're attracted to that and really we're not there because it is nutrients to our spirit man? How many times do we endure churches because this is where God said go? <laughs> Don't say amen. And, and, and we endure things to receive because the Spirit of God is literally moving there. And God says, oh, I know you could be in a better place, but I'm putting you here because I'm going to nourish your soul. Each one of these decisions to drink something other than water in the spiritual sense and, and inches you closer to spiritual dehydration. I know from experience... I can run to the cooler on a hot day of moving furniture, of moving things around, and loading a truck or unloading a truck, and I'm out there. I run up to the cooler, I open it up, and there's a water and a Mountain Dew. And I don't even consider it a temptation. I take the Mountain Dew, two of them if they're in there, and drink that. But by the end of the day, I'm noticing and I'm feeling that, that I don't have the energy that I need to have, the clarity of thought that I need to have. I drank plenty. But my body couldn't extract out of that that I was drinking what it needed. And the spirit men are the same way. You can get in your spirit where you want something and you go to YouTube and you start going through there to see who you're going to listen preach to you. And you may find something that you like and excites your person. But in, when you get done with it and you get into the test and you're running for your life and you don't have any endurance because that thing that you drank don't really help you in the situation you're in. That's why it's important that we're connected somewhere where God can speak to our spirit. If you're in a church and the message doesn't jump up and slap you in the face every now and then, you're in the wrong church. If every day is lollipops and lullabies and cotton candy and, and, and all of these things, it's not the right place. And can I tell you, I said it the other day, but God doesn't do the hokey pokey. You put your left foot in, you take your left foot out, you put your left foot back in, and you shake it all about. That's how people live their life. We put our left foot in, now we're not going to be in, now we're back in, now we're out again, and now we're going to shake a little bit. Ooh, that means we're holy. And, all that, and it means nothing. But if we go in and we connect, hallelujah, and we're, we're constant with God, we're committed with God, Hallelujah. I'm not even I'm not talking about church attendance here. I'm talking about relationship with God. And we're connected where he tells us to to eat from and to drink from. Then we're going to find while it might, may not be as palatable to us. It may not taste as good. It's nutritious for us. Hallelujah. Anybody ever had to eat anything that didn't taste good but it was good for you? As a matter of fact, everything they say is good for you normally nasty. This is great, bro. This is good for you. you need to when they say it's good for you, I'm like, uh-uh. I don't want to taste that. <laughs> I know what that is. She had a ginger drink last night. She was going to have me drink some. I'm like, that's going to light my throat on fire, isn't it? And Angela busted up laughing. She's like, oh, I drank it. Oh, my God, it's awful. I'm like, she almost got me. <laughs> Listen, when we have a loss of cellular activity or death to cells, to your skin and bones and tissues begin to die all because we don't get enough water and in the natural we call it premature aging you begin to lose hair you be, your skin begins to have creases and wrinkles prematurely because it's not hydrated in the spirit realm it's the same kind of thing we don't have a name for it it's premature aging in the spirit we call it backsliding in the spirit realm you're going backwards you're not drinking you're not you're not hydrated. You're not full of the Holy Ghost. And it's a slow fade. And after a while, even we will all become used to you. And you'll become used to us in our half-backslidden condition. And we will settle for one another's backslidings rather than call out of each other the king that's living on the inside of them. I want to speak to the king in you. I want to talk to that person on the, on the inside that's full of authority. That God has called a king and a priest. Hmm. 
A moderate form of dehydration may include a headache or muscle cramps. From a spiritual standpoint, that could be a tendency to withdraw and become disengaged. Keeping in mind this is spiritual, so would a lack of reading your Bible regularly, only praying ritualistically. God bless this food in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I pray every day, three times a day, breakfast, dinner, and supper. <laughs> but that's just ritualistic. You're not reaching God. We're not fervent. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When we end up with no fellowship with the believers as a manner of some is, he says, developing excuses and doctrines to excuse your behaviors and disgruntlement with headship, that's a headache. Always looking for the headship that will agree with you and to medicate your pain instead of correcting your condition. Listen, we become spiritually dehydrated in a moderate form. We will find ourselves at odds with the headship. We'll find ourselves at odds with what's going on around us. And that doesn't have to just be in church. You'll be cantankerous on the job. You'll always be having it out with your supervisor. Something's going on wrong. You're getting a headache. It's a headache because you're spiritually dehydrated. And you need to be full. Boy, this is going over like a lead balloon, but I'm still going to finish it because I know God gave this to me. <laughs> Whew. We withdraw. We become disengaged. And then I want to move us into the severe condition. It may include fainting, confusion, irritability, and even death. Spiritually, I'm talking about your symptoms are telling on you as to where you are today in your walk. Falling away from God and His family. Engaging in things that you know before you engage in them, they're wrong. Making an excuse and coming up with a clever way to hide it and everybody around you believes you, but you know it's wrong. They believed you because you're a good salesman. But you in your heart know it's wrong. And we get an excuse and we log on to somebody that will agree with us and we say, see right here, see they get it, they get it. No, they don't get it. They're dehydrated as you are. You need a drink from the fountain of living water. The Holy Ghost settles so many issues. I've got room in my theology for pre-tribulation exodus. I've got room in my theology for mid-tribulation th exodus. I've got room in my theology for a post-trib. I'm not telling you which one I adhere to. I'm just telling you in my theology I have room for a loving Jesus. But I also have room for Him on a white horse with a sword in His hand. I also have a, have a room in my theology for angels that come and divide wheat from tares. I also have room in my theology for... For apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, all of which have different demeanors. And we, we, we go to the one that most fits us. Prophets are drawn to prophets. Apostolic drawn to apostolic. Evangelists like evangelists. And we want to pick apart, but it's all one. It's just one in the family of God. And if we're full of the Holy Ghost, we need all of it. Whenever we get dehydrated, we start migrating to the ones that are like us. And I'm here to tell you today, God is calling us at this moment in time. You have been brought into His kingdom for such a time as this. We need people to be hydrant in the Holy Ghost. Hydrated in the Holy Spirit of God. We need people that are breathing in and breathing out the fire of the Holy Spirit of God. Walking under the unction of God. Laying our hands on the sick. Calling out devils from people's life. Not making a spectacle of them but releasing them from the things that are bothering them. Hallelujah. Whew. We fall away from God and His family. We become confused on our theological diatribes and convenient truths. Where are you in my sermon today? I've got about six more sentences written down here. Where are you in this today? How long has it been since you really drank from the well of water that Jesus spoke of? Not the well of... John Hagee or the well of Jesse Duplantis, I like them both. Not the well of Michael Lee, of Destiny Church. Not the well of some body that's intriguing that you've seen. But Jesus' well. Not religion or denomination. I have to drink this because this has been in my family lineage for years. And, and we believe this. 
you know, we, 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 we believe, say, sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. And so if you say it just right, everybody that agrees with you knows who you are and everybody that disagrees knows who you are instantly. Growing up, if, they, if you heard somebody say, I'm one God, apostolic, tongue, 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 holy, rolling, born again, heaven, I believe in the liberating power of Jesus' name, you knew where they went to church. I can tell you people's denomination by the way they fall out in the spirit. I'm not playing. I'm not playing with you. <laughs> I'm not making fun either. But people fall out a certain way. It's how they were taught. Somebody lay hands on a Pentecostal person, they look like they had an epileptic seizure. <laughs> they go all the place. Somebody else, if, if, if you lay hand on a Methodist person, they're just like, mm, they're so polite. They just fall right over. Other people fall forward. A lot of Church of God people fall forward, by the way. I know a bunch of them. And I, I, heard, I heard a guy teach on it one time. If you're really of God, you're going to fall forward. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I never thought about that. Better remember that next time I do a courtesy drop. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? It gets all mixed up in this natural. But if we're drinking from the well, I don't care if you swing from the chandeliers. <laughs> if you're drinking from the well, and you get, well, as long as when you land, you walk out of there whole. See? See, I, I, I've had enough of shouting and dancing and falling over and getting up just as sinful as we fell down. I want to see change in people's lives. I want to see us converted. I want to see us get up off the well and go into the city like our story talks about and tell him, come look at this man who told me everything about my life. And she became the first evangelist in the New Testament. And she was a woman. Whoo, there goes some theology too. Hmm. Hallelujah. I don't want to drink from the mirror of choices that the convenience store of religion offers me. I don't want to drink from the online bargain brand made in China because it's half the price. I want the authentic Holy Ghost and fire experience that will change my life forever and totally quench my thirst. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Let's stand in His presence as we get ready to go out of here today. I hope I've brought you to a place where you've at least thought, when have I last drank from the well? Do I just expect it to be there when I go out there? When have I settled into this place? I think it was Lauren L. Harris or somebody used to have a song back in the 80s and it was singing, There he was just waiting in our old familiar place An empty spot beside him where once I used to wait to be filled with strength and wisdom for the battle of the day. And I would have passed him by again, but I clearly heard him say, I miss my time with you. All those moments together. Don't go with this music, but it's still impactful when you think about God saying, I miss my time with you. I've been waiting on you like we used to meet. I never stopped. I've sat here the, every morning waiting. I know you was in a hurry. I, I helped you get that deal. I, I knew you were going to need to be in a hurry, but I, I just thought maybe you'd pop in on, let's talk a minute. I could give you one sentence that would close the deal. I could help you. But we get so caught up in the body that the spirit is thirsty. And so today I just hope that somewhere in this random thoughts on Christianity, you have been able to find a gauge to be able to tell where are you. Are you in a mild state of dehydration or a moderate state? Or God forbid you're in a severe state. Has it been so long that now you're not even drinking from the well? You're drinking from the poison of the enemy. You're drinking from pornography. You're drinking from adultery. You're drinking from the, from the well of pleasure. And your spirit man is comatose. He's on life support. The only thing that's keeping that beep going is the intercession from your mama and your grandmama and somebody in your family. 
The only reason it's not flatlining is because somebody else has you. It's a machine.